nice honor um, as when Jeanette gave the talk. I was trying to reflect back, you know, how old was I when the NITRED program first started? I was actually in fourth grade. So, so it's, it's, this is a huge honor to be able to speak uh, about sensors and the role that sensors are having in our daily lives. Um, so what are sensors? So sensors are basically these little devices that collect information about the physical world. They're all around us. Um, but one of the important components of sensing is actually the embedded systems behind it. So embedded systems are these little microprocessors and devices that take, it, take this information, do a little bit of computation and processing on it, and then ship it off to something else. And so the, the critical role of sensing is these embedded systems that we've been able to innovate on in the last 20 years. And now we're at a point where a lot of these things are going to become a reality. So we've seen the automobile example numerous times, but I want to still talk about that a little bit. So sensing is already around us. Uh, in fact, the modern automobile is a great example of this. Um, if you just look at the safety features in the modern automobile, you have things like anti-lock brakes, um, uh, traction control, collision avoidance, rear view cameras. These are all devices and components that requ heavily require sensors. In fact, the little device that, ha that you have in the passenger seat that disables the airbag is a, was a federally funded project that basically built that capacitive sensor that's our, that, it, that it's in millions of cars already. And so there's a lot of great examples of how sensors are becoming parts of our, are becoming integrated into our daily lives. And these were once luxury features that are now mandated. In fact, TPMS sensors or tire pressure management sensors are going to be uh, mandated in the next couple of years. Anti-lock braking, airbags, airbag disabling systems are all part of these things that are now available in cars, and manufacturers won't make a car without these features. And so the vision of computing now with sensors is this idea where computing is actually this notion of implicit interaction. Uh, the, the, the famous quote that I'm always inspired by is by Mark Weiser, who was the CTO of Xerox Park in the early 90s, who said, the most profound technologies are the ones that disappear in the background, and they weave, them the, weave themselves in the fabric of everyday life. And so basically, you know, this notion of sensors being able to collect data throughout the day and being able to make these decisions in the background is really going to be critical. So this notion of invisible computing. But at the same time, there's just enough information that's fed back to the person. Right, so this notion of sensing and feedback. So the analog braking system, you don't really have to think much about it. You don't have to pump your brakes anymore. You just hit the brakes and it, you know, it, it does its thing. But at the same time, there's just enough relevant, actionable feedback that comes back to the driver so they need to know what to do. So they don't have to worry about pumping their brakes. They just need to know just enough information, although the ABS system uh, intervened or it's, it, it seems like it's failing, so you might want to get it checked out. So that, 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 that synergy between sensing and feedback is really critical. And a lot of this actually pulls on many different disciplines. So without sensors, uh, with just sensors, are not going to really solve these critical problems. So sensors plus embedded systems plus machine learning, because a lot of the things that we're doing is inferring information from the sensor streams. And then human-computer interaction in terms of how do you actually feed this information back to, pre to, to um, enable some of these uh, actionable feedback interfaces. And so the car is a great example of this. But a lot of the work that we've been doing in the research communities that have been federally funded have also extended this vision beyond cars. You know, you know, we've seen a lot of work in health, safety, and sustainability. So I just want to highlight some of these different examples. Um, in health, there's been a number of projects. You know, one of the examples that I really like to talk about is the Microsoft Connect, which was one of which was initially as, uh, d you know, developed as a gaming platform, which is a 3D camera. So not only do you get you know, the image of whatever it's looking at, but you get the depth information as well. So now you're seeing a number of different projects uh, popping up because the Microsoft Connect has really lowered the barrier of using that technology to, uh, to be able to do that kind of sensing. And so surgical robotics is one example. It's being able uh, for a doctor to basically use gestures and hand interaction, basically what they would typically do during a procedure to remotely control robots from a distance or even as a training procedure. It really lowers the barrier because these, these devices are much cheaper now. Mobile phones are becoming more and more ubiquitous, and you're seeing tons of projects where you, think, you see things like ultrasound machines integrated to a mobile phone, both for uh, uh, care within uh, various facilities, but also doing care outside of facilities where you don't have access to these technologies. Also looking at using sensors that are already integrated onto the phone, the accelerometer, the microphone, to do a number of medical health sensing. In particular, one of the projects we've been working on is using the microphone by itself to do lung capacity and spirometric measurements without having to have an expensive spirometer with you. So being able to do that without any hardware at all. And also on-body sensing. There's a number of projects that's looked at putting sensors on the body to be able to collect physiological information about the body in real time and feeding that information back to medical professionals. And also contact lenses that can use 
materials in your eyes to basically do some uh, electrochemical analysis to figure out, well, what kind of physiological conditions are happening. And also smart home sensing where we've looked at, you know, looking at uh, medication regimens or looking at how you can track medication to basically assist one in terms of making sure that they're taking the right regimen. And in safety, one of the canonical examples are in bridges and safety of the road systems where you have sensors deployed there to basically do strain gauge testing to see if a bridge is about to fail or if there's any damage after an earthquake. Tsunami alerts. So this is a lot of recent work in this place where they're installing really sensitive pressure sensors on the, on the surfaces of the ocean floor to basically predict tsunami events thousands of miles away. In fact, I actually had the, uh, the honor of play, uh, playing with one of these sensors where the the demo was basically they put this sensor on a table, and he said, open and close that door. Oh, it picked up that, you know, that the air being moved by opening and closing the door. He said, no, 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 close the door and tap on it. Just a little jiggle within the little latch was able to pick up the waveform that's created by the movement of the air pressure in that room. So just imagine what else you could do with that. Home safety and loss prevention. You know, one of the things that you have in your home is a, is a smoke detector. Well, what, what, would you, what would you do if you could actually have an ability to know that you, uh, something's about to happen? So fire hazard detection. So one of the things that we've been working on with Allstate is looking at technology that can predict when fire's about to happen. So arc fault problems or other overloaded circuits where fire may be a hazard. And also looking at ways that you can install sensors in trees in a neighborhood to see if there's potential tree damage or if a tree is failing and, and if there are some storms that might occur, what can you do to basically sense that before a tree may actually fall? So my wife and I had an unfortunate incident of a tree falling on our backyard just a few days ago. So we haven't quite solved that one yet, but eventually we will. And, and more recently, sustainability has been a, a, a huge area of focus. We're looking at using sensing technology to monitor energy and water use. Right now, we have very little visibility in how much energy and water that we use. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And also, automated appliances and lighting control systems to uh, come up, coming up with ways to reduce our consumption by taking advantage of the sensor data. And then also, smart grid load balancing. You know, so right now, we're trying to figure out ways that sensors can play a role where we can you know, tailor energy a usage to particular areas and being able to shift those loads dynamically uh, in different areas. So one of the examples I want to talk about uh, really briefly is this area of residential resource monitoring, it's something that my group has been working on fairly extensively the last couple of years. Um, often when I talk about residential energy monitoring, people say, well, isn't it the big factory that's down the road that's consuming a lot of the energy in the water right now? It's, yeah, it turns out it's maybe, but it, a quarter of our energy use is actually what we do in our daily lives in our home. In fact, water, more than half of the water used in this country is basically the residential water that we consume uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, this is treated water, so this isn't water for irrigation purposes. So this is actually uh, clean treated water. And so over 50% of it is in our daily homes. But if you think about it, what kind of feedback do we get in our homes? We have this ugly looking meter thing on the outside of our house that my mom often tries to hide or try to remove. And when I tell her, if you try to remove that thing, you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna get in trouble. You'll probably get put in jail for removing your meter. But, uh, but it's this little device on the outside of your house that really doesn't tell you much, right? I mean, how do you read information about energy use from this meter that has pretty fairly esoteric units and uh, hard to read gauges and interfaces? And in fact, water meters are buried and you can't even get to them. You've got to brush a bunch of leaves off before you get to them. And even what you get at the end of the month is very limited, too. You get this bill that says, you know, here's how much you owe and here's how much energy you've consumed. And again, these units are pretty esoteric, kilowatt hour, CCF, gallons. I mean, no, nobody really understands that. So that's an act, that actually is an unfortunate bill that one of my colleagues received. It's a $3,000 water bill. Um, and at the time, I got excited because I was curious what happened, but he wasn't very excited at the time. And at the bottom right, it actually says $3,000 were debited from your bank account, so, so you better watch out. So it turned out that uh, he had an irrigation leak, but our billing is every other month, and so two months later, 60 days later, he gets this bill, and he had no clue what happened. The funny thing was what they did was they mailed this with a little dye pack that said, you need to put this in your toilet because this will tell you if your toilet's running too often. If you do the math, if their toilet was running for 60 days, you still couldn't consume 10,000 gallons. So this is clear that they're, they're, even the utilities have very little visibility in where water or energy is being consumed. So how can you build technology that actually empowers consumers and also other stakeholders, utilities, appliance manufacturers, to get a, get a better understanding of residential energy consumption? And it turns out that a lot of work in the past, is that a lot of this work dates back to the 70s where environmental psychologists showed that you can reduce energy consumption by 15 to 20 percent, sustained reduction in energy consumption by providing the appropriate itemized feedback. So getting a breakdown of what you're consuming in the home. But the problem in the 70s was that 
building the technology to deploy this was incredibly hard. So what they had to do was they, take, they took painstaking measures to basically install a sensor behind every plumbing uh, appliance, every device in the house that had that rat's nest of a, a sensor deployment there where they got into the breaker panels, instrumented every circuit breaker, every different device you can imagine. So you couldn't really scale. They had, they, had, they had the ability to collect enough data in a few thousand homes, but how would you ever scale this into a real home? It wasn't until just recently where we have advances in embedded systems and digital signal processing uh, hardware that we can actually envision a future where we can do this now. And so this is some of the things that we've been working on where, you know, instead of taking this complicated sensor deployment, well, can we just build one sensor that tries to monitor the resource consumption in your home? And so one example here is on the left where you see the sensing and hardware part where we have two devices that we've built. One is a device that plugs into an electrical outlet, and so you don't need a sensor for every uh, device. It's a single device that plugs into one outlet. And what it does is it monitors the electrical noise over the power line that's the side effect of the uses of your various different electronic devices like your TV, your, your laptop charger, and, and computer. And it basically infers what's happening based on that model that we've created. So if we have a model of what a power supply looks like based on the emanating noise, we can actually figure out well, what just turned on. All right? Similarly, for the water technology, we have a device that screws onto a single hose bib. And it does the same thing. It looks at pressure noise, water pressure noise, to infer, well, what fixture was being used and how much water it consumed. So with single sensors and machine learning, we can start to figure out what devices are consuming how much energy without having to have a complicated sensor network deployment. But this is all possible because we've advanced so much in terms of digital signal processing technology to be able to do that in real time locally and ship this information off to a cloud-based interface where you can do a lot of the machine learning algorithms on a different server and then feed that information back. And so we've been able to build feedback interfaces like the one on the very far right there that gives you not only a con information about how much you're consuming, but a breakdown of how much you consume throughout the day and, and then providing this feedback uh, in an actionable form. But there's still a lot of challenges that remain in embedded systems and, and sensing. You know, there's a lot of work in the sensing side but one of the challenges is battery life. Now, we're going to have more and more sensors being deployed in an environment, but what are we going to do with all those batteries? So those, you know, I have a drawer that looks like the thing on the right there. Is you have all these batteries that I've gone through. And if you look at just the trend in, 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 in processor technology on the left there, which is basically density of transistors on a, on a chip, uh, if you were to plot density of battery capacity, it's there. It's flat, right? I, even, I was even being generous and gave it a little slant there, too. Um, but, but pretty much capacity is pretty flat right now. And so there's a lot of work still needed to be done in terms of how do you optimize embedded platforms, coming up with new algorithms and new operating systems on an embedded, uh, on an embedded solution that really gets the power down. Because battery technology is only going to be, only going to yeah, get us uh, so far. And so a lot of it is all computational. Um, and then there's other approaches that, that the community has been looking at, which is new power harvesting techniques. What are alternative power sources? So on the right there is an example of a project that was, that's being done where sensors are actually harvesting energy from the HD towers that are already out there. So basically the HD TV signals that are being emanated from 100 kilowatt uh, towers that are in your neighborhood to it basically use that radiated uh, energy to harvest energy to power sensors. So what are some other alternative wireless powering technologies, solar technologies that we can leverage to power these sensors? Uh, so in summary, we've made a lot of progress in sensing systems and embedded systems. Huge amount of potential impact. A lot of the application areas that we'll be talking about today, and I have talked about, sensors play a critical role there. And I think it's only just going to grow. And, uh, and there's a huge emerging uh, need for low power sensing solutions and cre creative ways to really get the power consumption down. And something I really didn't talk about today, which is ways to provision these sensors. So you're going to have these sensors that are available to consumers, just like the energy monitoring technology that I mentioned, where it's easy to deploy by the consumer. But how do they actually provision these things? There's a reason why the wireless router is the number one uh, most returned consumer electronic device. You know, the RMA for wireless routers, is, it, it's orders of magnitude higher than the second most returned device uh, on the market. But it gives you, there's a lot of value add with the wireless router, but it's still incredibly hard to provision. That's something that we have to start to address soon before we get to that point. All right, thank you, and I'll take questions. What, uh, on the uh, question of uh, available power, is there any possibility that we can get away with you know, biologically generated uh, electricity for some of these sensors? I mean, literally plug into the nearest tree, so to speak. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's actually a great example. So there's been some projects where, um, so in fact, you can harvest energy from a tree. So if you want to do a quick experiment at home, you get a voltmeter, put it in the tree trunk, and put the other probe in the ground, you'll actually get 10 volts out of it. Um, so, so there's been work in that space as well. One of the challenges with power harvesting is that, um, is that typically the power source is really dependent on the application you're deploying it for, right? So for tree sensing, it's perfect. But what we're doing with tree sensing, it works well. Solar only works outdoors. It's not going to be a sensor that's in your cabinet drawer or whatever. So that's one of the challenges is with power harvesting. It's never general purpose. It's very rarely general purpose. But, but yes, there's, there's a significant amount of possibility there. Exactly. All right, very good. Uh, uh, thanks again to both of our speakers.